Hi everyone and welcome to the 6th Conversation and Chatterfest 2023. Call it a festival, a summit or a conference at its core. Chatterfest is a series of very important conversations that address disability and neurodiver- neurodiversity inclusion, accessibility, advocacy, representation and autonomy. Over one month, we intend to have conversations with over 20 speakers across 10 organizations to unpack each of these themes uh, to celebrate World Disability Day 23. We are your hosts, Aditi and Alap. We are the co-founders of Much Much Media and Much Much Spectrum, and we are a neurodivergent couple. Today, we have with us Rahul Jindal, along with being our mentor at Much Much Spectrum. Rahul is a global director at Google. Rahul enjoys building better product, better systems, better narratives, better organizational capabilities, and quality revenue streams. He's a highly committed, results-driven, and relationships-oriented general management professional with multi-industry experience across North America, EMEA, and APAC. Leveraging his strong customer mindset, he has partnered closely with senior cross-functional stakeholders and influenced successfully across organizational boundaries. Rahul used to head up the Disability Alliance ERG in its initial years and advocates for neurodiversity and disability in personal and professional capacities. Rahul's self-discovery happened after his son's son care of autism diagnosis. Thank you both. Uh, really glad to be here. Very, very thankful for what both of you are doing in terms of building very high quality educational content for the community. I'm sure this is very uplifting for the community, but also uh, you know, very invaluable in mainstreaming and you know, uh, raising awareness, which helps everybody. So very personally grateful to what both of you are doing and what much, much uh, spectrum the channel has become. So very, very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Rahul. you. So Rahul, um, you know, you have been a caregiver to care of now uh, for almost nine, ten years, um, during which time you've discovered the world of neurodiversity, discovered the world of disability. Uh, you're a caregiver currently also. Uh, so how has your experience of self-discovery of giving care to someone highlighted the need for changes in existing policies and systems that we have in India around neurodiversity and disability? Yeah, I think um, uh, much like with many others, I think my journey in understanding the space with its positives and deficiencies started when this became a personal topic, uh, which itself, I think I would say that it shouldn't be like that. Right? Why should people learn about this topic when it becomes a personal topic? It should be uh, it should be general knowledge in the purest sense of that phrase, right? uh, but it is not general knowledge, it is specialized knowledge. Uh, so yes, uh, w- one way that is not thrilling is that therefore it takes a long time to build knowledge to be familiar with how to navigate one's role as a caregiver also, right? Uh, to it takes many it took me many years and it takes many years to even come to that grounding of acceptance, right? That grounding of understanding. It just takes too long. Now, imagine if this was general knowledge, then it wouldn't take that long, right? In fact, mm-hmm. after going through the agonizing period myself uh, as an individual, as a father, uh, as a family, uh, my my desire, my wish is that, you know, the day of diagnosis should be the day of hope, not the day of despair. But I think it is a day of despair because it is specialized knowledge. So I think one way the system needs to improve is to, you know, and thanks to, of course, private efforts that you both are making, many other individuals across the world in India are making. But I think we have to live to see the day when uh, this topic is general knowledge. So that like when some parent realizes that my child will need spectacles Mm -hmm. to assist with their vision, they're not they're not spending that day or that year or the next few years crying that, oh, my God, my child will need spectacles. It is general knowledge that spectacles enhance vision. Mm -hmm. Many people wear spectacles. Excellent quality of life can be attained by people who wear spectacles. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why is it so different for the day of diagnosis of any neurodiverse condition? Mm -hmm. Uh, The system is failing us first and foremost at that very uh, level. Then, of course, you know, if you look at the life of an individual uh, through their, you know, early education years, through their middle education years, higher education, what do they do after education? Mm. Um, what do they do uh, for other life events like finding a partner? Uh, what do they do uh, about starting a family? What do they do when their own parents depart? 
I mean, if you look at the whole timeline of mm. you know 50, 60, 70 years, I think the system is deficient across the board. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to diagnosis services itself, the early education, the mid education, the higher education, and I I was only saying schooling years, but then also what about at the bachelor's and the master's level, employment, other support, integration, you know, uh, support. Uh, from a, let's say, psychological consultations, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think uh, in India, while I'm, you know, a proud Indian, but I do feel that this is a, a realm in which I think much, much, much more needs to be done. Absolutely. Uh, so, so yes, the system needs to improve quite a lot. You know, the, the, the way you put it, uh, Rahul, I think... Um the system seems to be designed to benefit only a very certain sort of group of people, correct? Uh, typically, you know, we know what that template of that typical person looks like, able-bodied, of course, privileged in a lot of ways. The system has been created in order to sort of support those people, to benefit them, etc., etc. There's a lot of things that become part of the system, such as sensitization sessions, such as uh, various programs that talk about inclusion at different levels etc etc to some extent those help to some extent those do the function that they are supposed to but systemically if you look at it it is still something that uh, is created in order to exclude certain people how can that systemic uh, change or or maybe a better question would be does that systemic change need to happen in order to actually see inclusion or is it just, you know, levels and levels of these initiatives and uh, programs and all that that need to be coming in to help. Yeah. I think it's a profound question. Uh, I think both need to happen. Um, if I zoom out, right, and I talk about the general a couple things. So one is that I think when you are a minority of any kind, you experience exclusion, right? You experience mm -hmm. a different experience. Uh, your experience is different. Uh, now, this could be a religious minority, this could be, uh, you know, socioeconomic uh, differences of minorities, uh, these could be gender, these could be an intersection of these things, of course, then, you know, ability or perceived lack of ability. Uh, minorities do experience the system differently in their respective context. So that that is just the way it works. But how can that experience be palatable how can that experience be non-burdensome is that the system then improves over a period of time so with that generic truth one the the generic truth two is that in any country in any economy the systems are installed by one of two parties right either mm -hmm. they're installed by pub, their public systems that means they're installed by the governments or those in in governing capacity or they are installed by private efforts right any system mm. not talking neurodiversity here, but any system so let's say you look at the system of road transportation right that topic is usually dealt by the government the system of schooling the system of healthcare, right uh, it is done both by government as well as private so net net if a system is not there either the government or private efforts or both will install that system. yeah i feel uh, private efforts are of course welcome private efforts are driven by one both realization that the lack of a system is there so for example you look at therapies right or early intervention <laughs> a lot of the therapy centers are actually set up by parents themselves right a lot of the special schools so called uh, are set up by parents or siblings themselves Maybe over a period of time, non-related parties realize that there is some capital pool here. There is some you know, money to be made by providing a product or a service. Uh, so I think to your original question, both are needed. Um, I, I feel on this uh, realm of neurodiversity, the supportive systems, whether they are diagnostic centers uh, or they are intervention centers or they are, uh, you know, some shadow teacher construct or schooling years and so on. They are unfortunately in India today almost exclusively uh, run by private enterprise, right? And private enterprise in this case usually is governed by, uh, you know, families who are affected that they set up some systems. Yeah. 
maybe there are some examples which are emerging where non related parties are also setting up for example there are some therapy centers being set up by people who are not directly in their personal family capacity connected to the cause but they realize that there is some money to be made and i see that in a good way right money to be because a lot of enterprise chases commerce right people will do something because they will get paid for it yeah. Yeah. so some some efforts are now starting to come up for profit in that sense but i feel what is sorely missing in our country is what is the government's role right mm-hmm. where the government at a central level or a state level uh, are, are those efforts high quality or not are those efforts uh, adequate or not i feel they are inadequate another reason i feel we don't see enough governmental endeavor uh, at the you know uh, central and the state government levels is because government by definition has to work on identified needs right what are the needs that you know the the populace has and i feel where the neurodiverse community is systematically marginalized today is that even the recognition of how large is this community yeah data i mean how many people who are on the autism spectrum so to say in india that number is woefully not there right the data that is there is uh, is woefully ignorant of the reality on the ground right i i think i've seen wildly inaccurate numbers like maybe the incidence rate is at 1 in 10000 or 1 in 1000 both of which are wildly inaccurate right mm-hmm. how do i know that because i have been to many 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 therapy centers which are which have waiting right they don't have slots to give how can it be true that if this was such a rare condition of 1 in 10000 that your neighborhood therapy center doesn't have slots for a child to take therapy sessions so it can't be what is the right number i don't know but my belief is that there is no reason that the incidence rate in india is systematically different uh, as a population compared to any other country which measures it better so let's say a us or a uk or a south korea or other such countries so i would like to believe that the rate is for autism alone is got to be about 2 2.5% right the rate for other neurodiverse conditions will be over and above that i think all things put together my guess is it should be more in the 10 to 15% range so we are talking more 1 in 10 or 1 in 9 for autism alone i think we should be talking 1 in 30 uh, and so on and so forth so that's very very far away that if i'm even uh, approximately correct that is very far away from the census data that the government uses mm-hmm. that that is one systematic gap here that if your data itself is wrong then you are diagnosing the problem incorrectly if you're di- diagnosing the problem incorrectly you're obviously solving the problem incorrectly so i i feel government uh, uh attention to the space needs to be first and foremost changed at the data level once the data is more accurate of uh, accurate reflection of the reality on the ground then of course you know then the next battle front is to allocate resources accordingly and once the resources are allocated then what should those resor- those resources be used for right uh, and then we come to other things and we can talk about that also i have a good mm-hmm. question here sorry before uh, we move on because we're on the point of data you mentioned that systems typically work two ways one is there is either government in- intervention or then there is private player intervention um a lot of private player initiatives are comparatively smaller they happen on more um, local levels there will be a therapy center in there will be maybe five small ones in hyderabad all run by different families there will be five in bombay 10 in bombay jo bhi hai um my point is uh, you know the market Uh, is is definitely there it's open a lot of people know about it also sure that hasn't been government intervention uh, wh- why does that stop private players from uh, private private players also have uh, a ton of money so why does that stop private players from investing doing the research coming up with data and uh, encouraging other people to invest also in the space and then therefore widen it because for a long time i mean i don't know how the tech industry exploded this way but i know that there were some grants there were some there was obviously a lot of leeway given to tech entrepreneurs to uh, build big build out big companies uh, and that is the way that this this has opened up but chalo if you're not getting government intervention what is stopping private players from coming in and you know opening up the market 
Yeah, I think it's a, it's again an important multivariate type of a problem in that sense, right? But if you look at it, what is needed are services, right? So if you look at teaching or education, it is a service. If you look at other healthcare related interventions, they are a service, uh, right? If you look at therapy, it is a service. If you look at counseling, it is a service. So we are talking about what should be a large services industry, right? Now, for the services industry to be set up by non-related parties for whom it is not a family topic, they again have to be governed by the data itself, right? That if, if somebody is an entrepreneur today, if somebody uh, says that, okay, I, I want to start a new venture, what are the spaces I will start a new venture in? Where do they go? They also look at some data, but for this space, unfortunately, that data is not there. Yeah. So government has not done research or census and published the data Private research companies have also not done a research and published the data. So if I'm an entrepreneur who is a non-related party, where will I learn that this is a large problem? You see how foundational, I mean, it almost sounds silly that we are in that state, but there is no data. If, if, uh, if there was credible data to say that one in 30 children or one in 40 children are on the autism spectrum, I'm sure a lot of private people will say that, wow, I mean, what is the LTV, so to say, and I say it very sensitively as a business person. But yes, if some child is on the autism spectrum, there is a certain expenditure the parents will have to make. Of course, whether they can afford it or not afford it is not what we're discussing here. But to, to use the concept of lifetime value, if mm. somebody was to become a service provider to a family with a kid with autism, right? if there was, if they, if you look at across the life cycle of that uh, family and the child, it would add up to a very large number, right? I mm. think in the US, Maybe some data was there that a family who can afford it will likely spend some maybe $2.4 million in the life of a child. Of course, you know, the condition is not homogeneous. So I, I don't know the qualifiers to that. But at least there is a number. Yeah. Now, if there is a number available in India, a private player will look at that, okay, if 1 in 30 or 40 children are being diagnosed and there is a certain lifetime value, let's take some simple numbers. Let's say 1 in 50 children. And let's say in a lifetime a family who can afford it will spend 50 lakh rupees, right? And I'm, I just completely made these numbers up to make my point. Now you do that <clears throat> one in 50 children, right? So that is uh, 2%, right? 2% of the children being born uh, with a certain multiplier of families who can afford it, let's say 0.2%. So 2% into 0.2% into 50 lakhs, that's a very large market size. Oh, where is that data? Even me as an advocate, I'm just making up this data to make my point. Hmm. But if credible research done by public or private enterprises, hmm. then that itself becomes a thing. So I'd say my best guess to uh, your question, Alap, uh, is that even that data doesn't exist for an entrepreneur to be, to think that, hey, here is potential in the space. Hmm. Right? So yeah, if we can find credible research bodies, I would say that would be the most urgent need to start to guide people towards this. Hmm. Uh, you know, Rahul, uh, recently National Family Health Survey 6th uh, edition happened and uh, sadly disability was excluded from that uh, from that data and uh, the, the reason that a lot of people, when, when we talk about data uh, to a lot of people, they their reply is that there is so much stigma that people don't even reveal that they have a family member with a disability. Do you think that the stigma is also uh, feeding into, uh, I mean, uh, the whole uh, problem being that we don't know that there are so many disabled people who exist in India? I think uh, the stigma may be real, but but I always look at societies as living organisms, organisms right? I mean, they, the belief system is not static. For example, let's look at a different uh, kind of... Uh, you know, diversity or difference in society, which is that of sexual orientation, right? I'm sure there is plenty stigma. I mean, the media sometimes perpetuates uh, stereotypes, but that's not uh, stop more and more people from coming out, right? So I, I think that honestly feels like a very lazy argument to me that just because some people may be stigmatized and they may not share, so let's not do the census itself. I mean, come on. I mean, there you got to have a better excuse than that. Yeah. Uh, right. So, yeah, maybe maybe the response rates may not be as much. But I mean, stigma 
is there when somebody identify that that family in that city has a disabled family member but we are talking census here i mean this is supposed to be high level anonymized yeah. numbers yeah. right so so i feel that this is somebody just giving a very poor set of excuses if the intent is there to build reliable data on a certain percentage of the population i think there are many many ways to do it in a way which protects the dignity of all survey participants uh, and you know i mean if you were to explain that hey good data will help you get better services from public and private players why will families not participate right mm-hmm. i i think i just feel that there is a lack of intent mm-hmm. yeah i think you that's know. the most sorry i think that's the most important i think that's the more important uh, bit with regard to stigma i just wanted to add that bit um, that the fact that um, you know uh, people feel that not too many uh, services not too many um, you know there's not too many products exist in this space will probably feed it to the stigma that they wouldn't want to maybe reveal too much about having disabled or neurodivergent people in their families i think it's also about like putting the onus on the disabled person and their families uh, and almost saying like okay it's like disability is your problem quote and quote problem and you have to deal with it and a lot of people come from that thought process that okay if there is a disabled person in my family and if places are not accessible then it's not the system's problem but it's not a systemic problem but it's a problem that we have to deal with or we have to find solutions to so i think uh, like putting the onus on the systems is i think uh, also very important and because uh, rahul we are we are also talking about policies and uh, uh, policy changes that we need there is rpwd act uh, 2016 uh, which states that there need there needs to be inclusive inclusive schools uh, buildings need to be accessible and there are so many things that disabled people are advocating for which are already mentioned in the rpwd act it's just that it's not been implemented uh, yet do you think we need some policy change or is there any intervention that we need to uh, implement these uh, policies that are already existing in india yeah my my general belief is that the laws in india are not bad it's the actually the enforcement of those laws which are uh, you know which leave much to be desired and i feel that that same extends to the rpwd 2016 also uh, that i think uh, maybe the advocates who got that you know uh, act sort of written down maybe even passed uh, they did their part but now i think um, it's of course disheartening that even with a good intent and a good uh, set of descriptions you know that's not the experience of the person on the ground so so i just feel that you know we are a democratic country there's a certain way things are supposed to work there's a certain way the system is supposed to work so i feel that it is about the need is about continued kind of uh, raising awareness including with legislatures and not and all that right uh, uh with the with the three parts of the system in a democracy right with the judiciary with the legislature and the execution uh, or the executive uh, in that sense so i think one just has to keep raising and of course it is very burdensome that you know in addition to tackling disability uh, in one's family one then also needs to contribute towards raising the voice right i mean uh, i'm sure there's a term for it but 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 it is that that's the way it is in that sense but i actually think that the natural justice is that not all disabled are in underprivileged families there are also privileged families uh, who are impacted by it and it is just a you know naturally occurring uh, uh, difference in in that sense right uh, so uh, i feel that we need more uh, champions in with privileged backgrounds to make the change happen at the top levels of the way the government or the judiciary and and the other work i actually feel very encouraged that uh, even our current chief justice of india has a direct family connection with disability and you see that when that happens you know there are changes that come into place so i would like to say that um, you know this is a complex societal change problem i don't think only protesting uh, is the way out i also feel that people who are in in right in powerful positions who are doing their role correctly or who are making a difference i feel we also need to celebrate them more right because it is a human need to be celebrated in general right now if there are advocates uh, 
whether they are parent advocates or whatever their connection is that they are doing the right things for disability in india can can we including your channel people like me others can we also celebrate them more so that if there is a third party there who also wants to be celebrated they also see that such an act is celebrated so they, they will also be motivated to do such an act which is to be of support to the disability community so i'd say that we just have to because it's a complex change there is no one answer so in addition to lobbying protesting i feel celebrating uh, uh, is also important so you know there's no one way to make societal change happen but i think it'll just have to be a multitude uh, it'll have to be a full toolkit that that is used uh, but to answer your question i don't think that policies need to be changed the existing policies defined policies need to be enforced better so i would say for example let's say in the city of mumbai if there's a certain part of mumbai where maybe you know the disability community feels better supported if there is one mall which has the accessible entry if there is one company which is employing you know diverse people if there is one municipal commissioner if there is somebody some government official uh, in any capacity who's doing the right thing can we make them you know a celebrity in a good way so that their peers in their own respective roles feel that oh wow that person man or woman got recognized therefore maybe i should also do it i feel that that is also important it it is not always about protest right yes protests have a role to play in a societal change but there are also other mechanisms no absolutely for allies i think it's a very important conversation to have because with the self advocacy movement going up um you know i think more and more middle ground needs to be found between allies and people who are self advocates uh, because at the end of the day we are advocating for the same uh, uh, mission so to speak uh yeah i'm we, i'm i'm curious to know about your experience with with the healthcare system what has that been like because um as as disabled people as people who are neurodivergent even as caregivers there's a lot of in and out uh, in and outs that we keep having with the healthcare system keep going in for different things keep um you know going to different um, experts different uh, there's of course the whole journey of diagnosis and then you know the building the Therapies. entire support support system in the in the way of therapy etc etc um with respect to access easy accessibility with respect to affordability how is that infrastructure set up in india in your experience yeah i, I mean i wish i had a more positive picture to paint here but of course the current uh, uh, setup in my experience is uh you know it's inadequate it's very expensive and it is also laden with a lot of misinformation uh in that sense uh, right so it's inadequate in the sense of how many pediatricians possess the capability to see the flags in a child who's developing differently uh at the appropriate age i think it's woefully woefully low uh yes change is happening more pediatricians are likely learning and they are learning from senior pediatricians who are by the way making more money out of this so i am okay with that i mean if money is their driver let that be but at least uh, you know it is increasing the awareness but even today i would like to believe that it's very very rare that a pediatrician possesses the skill set possesses the awareness to diagnose early because we know that one of the highest uh, uh, bestest indicators for later quality of life is early intervention right Uh, early support system uh, but if pediatricians are not diagnosing it correctly or most of them are not diagnosing it uh, at all uh, then that itself is an issue so it's uh, inadequate at that level then you of course talk about specialized skill set like pediatric neurology uh, when needed right that those numbers would be very very low i don't know what those numbers are i don't think anybody knows uh, but uh, but of course it's inadequate so so that's one is the inadequacy aspect of it if you talk about same lines therapists right if you talk about uh, special educators the very 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 low in fact somebody was telling me yesterday that the rci the rehabilitation commission of india or whatever the governing body is they've made it so difficult for somebody to become a a, a psychologist right there are so many bars to it etc now in a country where we are woefully inadequate in so many ways do we really need a very very difficult uh bar to become a practitioner right that itself is a thing if we talk about other constructs like shadow teachers you know woefully inadequate if you talk about uh, uh, in the school intervention for children woefully inadequate so that inadequacy is a, unfortunately a very 
broad based reality um it, second is it is expensive right and anything in a large socio economically diverse country like ours anything that is expensive is by definition exclusive uh, right so of course yeah. i feel fortunate that so far we have been able to afford the therapies that were recommended or interventions that were recommended but i also understand my privilege here i mean how many other families who need to go through a diagnosis or an intervention for a child are able to afford i think it's it it would be heartbreakingly low right it would be below 1% in that sense so what needs to happen to make access to such things more affordable also right and that, that's where the role of the government comes in uh, and of course government is operating off the back of data which is highly inaccurate and then we go into the vicious cycle again so it's it's also needs to be made in expensive but today it's expensive so that's a problem and third and very very importantly you know any area which is laden with desperation a parental desperation is also the source for quacks it is also the source for misinformation so i also see many many uh, you know heartbreaking stories of stem cell therapies and you know bariatric oxygen ch- chambers and this and that some equestrian therapy xyz i mean in a for a family who is already dealing with a whole landscape full of uh, despair do they need misinformation also but unfortunately that is true right there are lo- so many quacks offering quick cures offering cures i mean you're offering a cure for something which is a naturally occurring reality a neuro- neurodiverse like what is there to yeah. be cured right so so i think it's it's bad in multiple ways and of course awareness is the one answer but awareness itself is inadequate so that's why we don't see dramatic changes over 5 or 10 year horizons we don't see that uh, and i really really wish that the government the administration plays a bigger role in all of this mm-hmm. it cannot be just left to enthusiasts or self advocates right it, it needs a greater systematic fix in that sense mm-hmm. you you mentioned awareness in itself is inadequate uh, i i agree with that and i definitely agree with the fact that um, you know inadequacy uh, things being expensive and misinformation being out there is are, are three of the biggest biggest problems uh, awareness in and of itself might not be the full solve but isn't that uh, where it begins like isn't that where things start to happen uh, if there was no awareness maybe the government would never see the need to have uh, to have a census that included our data also right yeah yeah no of course everything begins with awareness uh, uh, but all i'm trying to say is that you know whose responsibility is to increase the awareness that shouldn't be just of the impacted party on any topic right including this one yeah. so uh, like, like what is the role of schools what is the role of hospitals or healthcare in general right what is the role of leaders of society what is the role of um let's say if a neurodiverse individual or disabled individual has to travel from point a to point b there are many other you know road transport right or air transport or uh, what is the role of the leadership of those bodies right mm. uh, we keep hearing of harrowing experiences that somebody from the community has at the airport what is the role of the airport authority so so i think yes awareness uh, Uh, certainly is the start of it all but should we only relegate the impacted party to also carry the additional burden of raising the awareness mm-hmm. right now it's not it's not as if like there are zero special educators in the country so there is somebody doing special education there is a curriculum these things are known it's not as if like autism or dyslexia or cerebral palsy or anything emerged yesterday right these conditions yeah i mean more needs to be told but these conditions are known to doctors are known to special educators so i think it is just the state of apathy uh, which just tends to be the barrier here right i mean sometimes awareness is also about topic that nobody knows about so for example when the corona virus came in nobody knew about it right so it is about raising collective awareness but i don't think that this is when it comes to neurodiversity it's the same thing it's, it's not the same paradigm mm. people know. but like i think it is really just about more people in leadership positions starting to feel their responsibility and to make them feel their responsibility is when i go back to that same playbook that it can't only be by you know putting them in a difficult spot i think it's also got to be about celebrating the ones who are doing it i think we have to use the full toolkit of influence hmm. right as 
say the sam dam dand ved right so we got to use a full full toolkit which includes uh, my favorite of celebration it also includes uh, uh, you know account holding people accountable and everything in the middle it's not just one thing mm-hmm. you know uh, i mean because you have uh, also uh, experienced the entire system you've gone through uh, like say education to healthcare you've experienced all of that as a caregiver and um, i mean every time we talk to parents we are on a lot of groups where there are parents of uh, children with disabilities there is uh, that sort of despair uh, because of inaccessible systems because uh, they are not able to afford those services and these are also uh, i mean w- the gap that we have also found is that the lack of neurodiversity affirming systems there are a lot of therapists there are uh, pediatricians but only a few of them a handful of them are neurodiversity affirming do you find that to be uh, like a problem no it's a huge problem right that um, if the default approach will be to cure or shape a neurodiverse individual i mean that is so damaging to the individual right so uh, it is a huge problem because unfortunately most of the therapy centers uh, are not neuro affirming right most of the school teachers are not neuro affirming uh, but at the same time i i do uh, look at the positive that i am on a few whatsapp groups myself whose title is neuro affirming parenthood neuro affirming support right etc so so i i would look at the positive on this one aditi is that yes it is starting to happen it is a very very small movement i myself did not even know the phrase neuro affirming till some time ago uh, right and i am an, i am i'm i'm supposed to be a parent here myself right so so i but i feel that you know this is how the society changes mm-hmm. right that yes it is a problem but there is also uh, a spark uh, there is also light there at the end of the tunnel we just don't know how long the tunnel is but we see the light at the end of the tunnel but if we see the light at the end of the tunnel and we keep moving towards it i think that you know the aperture of that light will only increase and it'll just come all bright at somewhere down there yeah no i think we definitely have like a lot of neuro affirming parents in the community for sure one yeah. is definitely you uh, there there's uh, aditi somenaran's mom um there is uh, this page called otty stories of fun yeah? and i think uh, that that number is like only growing uh, and yes, these yes. parents are all, also influencing so many other parents to uh, enable their children and to not uh, fit them into a particular mold but to let them uh, like expand uh, in in their own ways and like flourish in their own ways no absolutely i want to particularly call out the efforts of preeti dikshit of care autism who i think has single handedly done so much for the community than many 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 other people or you know governmental institutions i know she's taken the pains of documenting her own experience of raising her child she uh, is the moderator of a lot of whatsapp groups and she is the one from whom i finally uh, imbibed that phrase of neuro affirming so i think what i am super positive about is that you know every quarter if not sooner i am meeting some net new people who are practicing neuro affirming parenthood who are practicing neuro affirming education who are practicing neuro affirming intervention right so yeah i mean if you are meeting more and more people you know that the you know it is spreading the goodness is spreading of course we'd love this goodness to spread uh, much more deeply much more broadly but that's where all of our roles also come in of course what breaks my heart is that many parents are, even after knowing about their child's diagnosis actually uh, are not desirous of participating in spreading the word right and that that is of course the stigma topic that we were uh, discussing previously i think one of your earlier speakers explained it very beautifully that there is a certain shame attached to the fact that hey i have parented Uh, a person who is different than the majority right uh, so that is a human condition i would say but uh, you know uh, again kind of shining the light uh, on the people who are doing it in the right way will probably encourage others uh, also right i don't think anybody becomes a parent to be a bad parent right i think these are again from the lens of a parent also it is external stimuli 
that pushes them in a certain way and that stimuli is governed by narrative i think thanks to again the work that much much spectrum in its various avatars is doing i think you are also trying to correct the narrative many many others are trying to correct the narrative so i think if we just stay the course i think we will see a day in 3 5 10 years from now when you know millions of parents are doing it the right way uh, and then of course you know it's on them to also continue the narrative that way. so millions will become tens of millions will become hundreds of millions i think that's how change happens it's it's slow but but that's why it's worth it yeah you've touched upon uh, parenting and i think that is um, that is literally something that the more you talk about it the le- the the less you know uh, you've spoken because there's literally so much information there's literally so much lived experience to unpack on that front parenting is something that you know as as parent as a parent to a, a, a neurodivergent child of course that has its own entire journey uh, with regard to finding the right neuro affirming uh, you know uh, village around you finding the right neuro affirming therapists the right doctors the right uh, pediatricians experts etc etc um, on the other hand there's also uh, you know of course parenting neurotypical uh, people also has challenges of its own that's a whole journey in and of itself uh but i think the right kinds of parenting uh you know are not are not spoken about there are no systems in place yet to you know determine what those are or there are no there is is there help along the way is, is what i essentially want to get to you know how do you learn how do you imbibe those values in you how do you set goals uh because where we pretty much learn parenting from currently is to just see our parents do it and then you know pretty much uh you know filter out all the stuff that seems problematic and incorporate the stuff that doesn't but in a world that is so dynamic and so rapidly evolving is should places should things be put in place should processes be put in place systems be put in place to talk about good parenting talk about healthy positive parenting yeah no absolutely uh, i would say that in my own journey over the last 7 years i have seen positive change come about uh, right now i certainly see lots of whatsapp groups etc i think the good thing about an information deficiency is that the high quality information is available without borders right so uh, you know and the indian diaspora has traveled the world lived the world so many many parents actually pick up good neuro affirming practices from other countries but then when they come back to india they you know, these practices travel with them uh, right so i feel that living in the information age uh, i think this is a topic where you know many parents uh, who are physically moving back to india they are bringing those uh, practices uh, for a new parent i think this general generally the ability to uh, follow some apps like baby center and so on and so forth uh, right now these are not apps that originate in india but but the beautiful aspect is that information flow doesn't stop at the country borders right uh, so so that i feel with the good use of the internet and everything that the internet enables i think information about being the right parent is also uh, available without borders now um i think support groups are available i want to give a shout out to uh this non profit uh, led out of hyderabad called nai disha uh, right which whose whole purpose is actually to create parent support groups i'm sure there must be many others that i'm not aware, aware of so these efforts accrue over a period of time right they these efforts compound over a period of time and if i say it from uh, another context that you know the eighth wonder of the world is compounding right so these efforts at sharing the information also compound the great aspect of internet is that once you put something there it stays there right so if parents are creating artifacts uh, or their own experiences or checklists or uh, you know contact numbers this that on the internet on a website somewhere it is there for for prodigy right it is there forever so so yeah i mean but the the not so encouraging part of that is that this is all led by parents right uh, we need more state infrastructure we need more government infrastructure to be kind of doing this it cannot be just relegated uh, to as i have been saying the impacted party so that is there but yes i do want to end with a positive here that uh, even in my own limited journey of the last 7 years i am seeing a dramatically different uh, availability of information and the right perspective uh, of course i as one small cog in the wheel i try to play that role also right that because uh, many others know about my role 
as an ally or as a parent so some other connecting points will point new parents towards my direction and when they do then i take the time to kind of share my latest greatest knowledge base which it may have taken me 7 years but i try to tell that in 7 minutes to somebody right and i'm pretty sure there are hundreds if not thousands if not tens of thousands of other people who are trying to do that so somewhere i mean you know somewhere the whole corpus is growing uh, is how i would like to believe but yeah we are living in the information era we have a great tailwind uh, in in these efforts yes uh you know rahul you you uh, in our last conversation uh, when we uh, spoke about you spoke about uh, the 3c model and you summed it up like beautifully and that is also the reason that we really wanted to have this conversation and talk about this uh, in detail can you uh, can you tell us more about the 3c model yeah absolutely i think uh, this is just you know one parents prescription to the government if the government will listen i think the three c's are uh, first it is the census second it is commerce and third it is community i feel the government can play a role along these three dimensions i think let me start with census i think all of public spending or private spending starts with having the right data i our unfortunate reality today where we are quite behind other economies like a us or a south korea or a uk or a canada or an australia is that we just don't have good reliable data on what is the incidence rate of the various kinds of neurodiversity in our country right so how many children are on the autism spectrum disorder by age group how many adults are there what about dyslexia what about adhd what about other conditions we just don't have good data right if the government was to do a high quality job now i i don't want to paint government in one like there is no one person who's a government the many many research bodies etc etc so i don't know who the right one is but if there were more government backed government validated uh, entities who were to do a good job of the census of collecting data i think that would direct a lot of government expenditure as well as private expenditure towards it so please if government was to do one thing please do a high quality job of census so that's the first c the second c is commerce i have really come to believe over the years that you know supporting disability or supporting neurodiversity as long as it remains a charitable act an act supported by compassion alone i think we will never be able to find a uh, you know reliable repeatable scalable uh, integration of the neurodiverse community and their families with the rest of the society i feel most of the world is governed by efforts that relate to commerce right that i will provide you a product or a service and you will pay me for it i feel the good thing aspect here is that you know diversity or disability does not only impact the socially uh, or economically backward right it, it is uh, it is since it's a difference at the neurological level it actually is pretty uniform even from a socio economic strata so i feel we somewhere need to change the narrative of supporting disability from only being a compassionate compassionate charitable cause to actually a commerce driven cause and i look at the airline model there right so a lot of people are able to fly uh, in the economy class because especially internationally because the first class and the business class somewhere subsidize the economy class so if you were to think of the same thing that you know for families who are able to afford all sorts of support for their uh, uh, loved one in that sense i think we can use them to also subsidize for the others right so i i, I actually invite a uh, private uh, enterprise to actually build high quality products and services i think it was accenture research or someone who said that the collective purchasing power of families uh, with disability is about 6 trillion dollars globally right what is the data for india i don't know because there is no data going back to the first one but if it is 6 trillion dollars one can apportion it to india the point being is that you know building high quality products and services is a money making venture so i invite more you know private enterprise to build high quality products and services whether they relate to education they relate to healthcare they relate to integration they relate to engagement they relate to assisted living or anything like that there is real money here 
uh, there are families who are willing to spend for their loved one. Like which family will not want to spend for their loved one? If there are lots of families with a loved one with some sort of disability or neurodiverse condition, there are families who will afford uh, support to them. So please follow the commerce path. The role that the government can play in commerce is to connect right, private enterprise with the private consumption. Today, there is no discoverability of those also. If an entrepreneur wants to build high quality products and services, they don't even have government validated uh, you know, channels in which they can know that if I have to meet my target customer, how do I do it? So government can play a role in commerce in connecting uh, providers and uh, buyers. That's the second C of commerce. The third C uh, in my mind is community, right? Across the country, across the world, it's just individual efforts which are trying to help the community. I think the government can actually do a job of creating portals, uh, you know, which uh, connect, uh, you know, a community in, in micro sections in certain state, in certain city, but at a national level. Like, I have been a parent uh, uh, you know, for many years, I am only now realizing what kind of services are available to other children or parents in Goa or in another state. Why should it take such a long period of time? And I, I would like to believe that I expend a lot of my own effort in discovering. So why should it be such a uh, arduous task to identify who are the others in my community? Why can't government actually make it uh, more clearer in that sense if once they know that I have a child who is neurodiverse. Why isn't there push, you know, information available to me from the government? Uh, in fact, uh, the harrowing experience also is that, you know, parents who are trying to get a UDID card, that itself is such an arduous, uh, frustrating process, right? So I think the government can certainly play a much larger role to encourage the community to connect with each other. Uh, so those are the three C's in my mind. One is census, one is commerce, one is community. And I truly believe that government, a well-intentioned government, can make very significant strides in all these three things. Uh, I mean, data is something that is like very less spoken about. And that is the biggest gap in India. I mean, there are there are social security benefits and uh, there, there are so many disability benefits in general in other countries. And India, may it's, it's like, it's almost non-existent. Even in Yeah, because recognize the problem for the gravity that it carries. Right? Yeah. Other countries are able to do, not because they are better governments. I think they are just responding to what the data tells them. Now, if the data was to tell somebody that, hey, 10% of the population is underserved by your current programs, I'm sure we also have the government, uh, more or less at the central and the state levels, who will do something about it. But if the data tells them it is a 0.01%, then they will also apportion their resources and mind space to 0.01%. If it was to be 1%, then you see apportion it. If it was 10%, then you see you will see apportion it, right? So, so therefore, I'm in, and I think that solving for high quality data is a less difficult problem. But I think the solve starts there. I think it's more of a mindset shift than pretty much anything else. Because also, in terms of technology and infrastructure available, I think the government has enough and more, right, in terms of even the private players. So, uh, in terms of even forging smart partnerships that can help the government get this data and disseminate it out there, I think there's a lot of options available, Joe, that can make uh, that happen. So, I think it's just pretty much just the mindset shift that um, that needs to occur at, at a very grassroots kind of a level. No, also, I would say that, you know, given that so much of our country is connected to the internet now, Right, people. So many people use uh, smartphones. Uh, I, my last guess is about six hundred and fifty million Indians use a smartphone. So I think even if there were some private research institutions who would take this up, I feel that we'll something is better than nothing, right? If there was a group of PhD students somewhere in a reputed institution, uh, and if they were to start to use internet-connected individuals and start to estimate the proportion of the population which may be neurodiverse, that's a good start. That's better than nothing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, one day will arrive when the government will include uh, capturing this data in their census, but even census itself happens once in 10 years, etc., right? I think it's just the missing of high-quality data, uh, right? If you can actually get some few research institutions, whether, you know, humanities or business or whatever, 
if they were to do like what is stopping uh, some students in sit, sitting in some im uh, you know indian institute of management uh, or one of the iits to take this up as a project that hey why don't we simply estimate how many neurodiverse individuals are there what is their purchasing power the research methodologies have advanced that we don't you don't necessarily need to talk talk to every individual to know what the incidence rate is right i think it's just about raising that awareness uh, that hey this needs to be done uh, and i'm sure if we can get 20 30 40 50 different uh, teams working on it we can triangulate right we can get a range we can institutions can put their brand behind it and then i think the goodness start come through brilliant i think we'll wrap this up on that uh, amazing note about how more and more institutions how more and more private players can potentially come together and fill in the data gap so thank you so much rahul uh, thank you so much for your time i think this has been a very enlightening conversation very entertaining conversation uh, for all our viewers keep an eye on our socials for more information on our next chat uh, follow us on our socials at much much spectrum on instagram and much much media on youtube this is chatterfest 23 thank you once again to rahul and to all our viewers for tuning in thanks a lot thank you for having me and thanks for all the work you're doing thank you <laughs>